Um, I think the deepest I've had to go up was about my shoulders, mm -hmm. which was very cold because it was in like January. A little too cold for me. I don't like to get much deeper than about my hips. Welcome to Oysterology, a podcast about oysters, aquaculture, and everything from spat to shuck. I'm your host, Kevin Cox. My guest today is Betsy Stewart, who represents to me the kind of person who takes a small but good idea and through nothing but self-motivation and passion, turns it into something that will one day become important. She started a grassroots operation run entirely by herself to develop and implement designs to restore and enhance wild oyster reefs in Florida's East Coast estuaries. After getting her bachelor's in environmental science with a minor in biology and earth, oceanic, and atmospheric science at Florida State University, Tallahassee, she's now working on a master's degree in aquatic environmental sciences, also at Florida State. She also works with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and, in all her free time, has started the ZIP Project to develop and employ oyster restoration efforts in the Indian River Lagoon, which is a 156-mile-long estuary wedged between the barrier islands of Florida's eastern coast and its mainland. I was inspired by Betsy's independent, self-driven passion for both oysters and the environment and her willingness to put her time and energy into starting something very small but vitally important with the goal of growing it into something big. I know you'll find her to be as inspiring as I did, and, oh yeah, did I mention that she's only 23 years old? In our energetic conversation, we talk about her efforts in shellfish restoration, as well as such things as tropical storms, the beauty of mangroves, stalking people on the internet, listening to Dad, the shark bike capital of the world, and Prince Harry's connection to oysters. So relax and take a deep breath of fresh, youthful exuberance, drive, and passion with my guest, Betsy Stewart. Betsy, it is so awesome to have you on Oysterology. I, I, I can't tell you how excited I've been to talk to you. I like people who are self-driven, self-motivated to do important, interesting things. So when I first learned about the Zip Project, it was like, wow, this is really <laughs> cool. Who are these people? And then I realized these people is just you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell me about the Zip Project. What is it? So it is an oyster restoration project that I started just about a year ago. And I've always been interested in marine science. I've always had such a strong, you know, draw to the ocean and I always knew I wanted to do something involving marine science. I just never really know, knew what direction I wanted to go in. And during COVID, I was kind of just researching just a bunch of random information I was looking up, what was going on in the Indian River Lagoon. And I never really knew all these giant environmental problems we have down here in Florida. Mm. And I remember going to my dad and saying, like, why this is such a big problem. Why is no one really doing anything? Why is there no announcements? Why is there no projects? Why is there not a bigger outreach or awareness on all these different environmental issues that are going on? Like, what can be done about this? And he was like, it's a very simple solution, actually. Oysters. And I, he was uh. like, look them up, read all about them. They have all these environmental benefits just go and look at it. And I was like, how can this be such a simple solution? But no one really seems to be doing much about it. There's little projects here and there, but it's not a wide known piece of information that people know. So I dove right into it and kept researching it as the years went by while I was still in school. And I was like, you know what, let's do something about it. Let's create designs. Let's talk to people and just see what people are doing what kind of designs people are doing, what kind of projects people are doing, and let's go from there. And that's exactly what I did. I honestly really didn't expect it to go as far as it did, yeah. but I'm in it really deep now. I have to ask, though, mm -hmm. before you started this, did you enjoy eating oysters? I did, yes. I enjoy eating all seafood, to be honest with you, but 
definitely Easter's are up there with one of my favorites. It, it sort of feeds into, you know, the whole idea of restoration and keeping oysters growing, yeah. both for the environment, but also if it's to something eat. you love to yeah. eat, it, uh, <laughs> it definitely. motivates you a little bit, too. Just a bit. Uh, so let's just jump back real quick to your background. So I grew up in Winter Park, Florida, in Central Florida, but I'd spent a lot of my time in New Smyrna, about an hour from where I was from. My grandparents had a beach house there, so I spent a lot of my summers, any kind of free time I could have, I would spend it there. And I always knew I'd want to do something with marine science. Shout out to Mr. Carswell, my fifth grade teacher. He was <laughs> the one that, you know, we did an endangered species project. We, he was very big into marine science. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Like, that's it. I'm done. Here we go. Absolutely. That's pretty awesome. And I continued on, you know, middle school, high school, took marine bio classes, always was interested in the science classes. And then in 2018, I graduated from Winter Park High School and started at Florida State University. Mm -hmm. I joined a sorority and I started off as a bio major. Just, I didn't know environmental science was actually a major here for a while, but you know, taking bio with all the pre-med kids, that was not my gig. I found out environmental science was a major here and I switched over, which was a way better move for me. You know, the classes were definitely more my speed, definitely more my, perked my interest. Mm -hmm. And my senior year, I had the opportunity to intern at Gulf Specimen Marine Lab down in Panacea. Mm -hmm. And that really solidified, like, I'm in the right major. I'm learning the right things. Like, I'm on the right track. That internship was amazing. I learned so much more about marine species than I ever could. I learned about animal husbandry. I learned just about the ecosystem in the panhandle. I learned how to even give tours and get other people interested in marine science. So it really solidified, like, I'm doing the right thing. I'm on the right path. And yeah. being able to share it with others and inspire mm -hmm. others, because what you're doing really is inspirational. Mm -hmm. I want other people not just to hear the interesting things that you're doing, mm -hmm. but to just say, hey, I can do this too. Yeah, so I really did enjoy coming home from my internship, even now telling people, like, guess what I learned? Look at this cool video or whatever. All my friends were really into it, especially because... I was the only girl in environmental science in my entire sorority. No one well, else did this. Did your sorority sister say, like, wait, you you do what? A lot of people would say I lived out their childhood dreams of actually studying marine bio and marine science. They're like, you continued on with the childhood dream. And I was like, yes, I did. Absolutely. Now, New Smyrna, is mm -hmm. this on the Gulf of Mexico? New Smyrna is on the East Coast. What other bigger towns that I might recognize are nearby? It's in between Cocoa Beach and Daytona. Well, right in the middle of those two, yeah. So much of the east coast of Florida is just sort of beach, sand, and, mm -hmm. and then the Atlantic. But there are inlets and estuaries and that sort of thing? Yes. So New Smyrna is more of a barrier island. You have to take a big bridge mm -hmm. over the northern end of the Indian River Lagoon to get to the beach. And between the Atlantic Ocean and the mainland, you have New Smyrna and you have the Indian River Lagoon, which is this huge, biologically diverse estuary that stretches for about New Smyrna all the way down 156 miles. It's really big and it's super diverse. I think there's over a thousand animal and plant species that can be found here. Um, very brackish water, so half fresh, half salt water. So a lot of different species live in this area and it's really beautiful. I mean, my favorite restaurants overlooks it and you can go kayaking, go fishing, go paddle boarding. That's good. It's really amazing. I that is it. one of the amazing things about oyster aquaculture and wild oysters is that they're usually in really beautiful places. <laughs> For sure, yeah. So you had this childhood interest that you yeah. then developed more in college and really mm -hmm. and did some internship and saw that this was something that you really could sink your teeth into. What caused you to actually start the ZIP project? You know, I was really just talking to a lot of people, playing around with these different designs, seeing what other people were using material-wise, shape-wise, how well they were going, how successful they were. And I was like, I want to do this too. I would love to try this out. So I played around with a lot of different designs, a lot of different materials. And the place that I did my internship my senior year, the Gulf Specimen Marine Lab, talked with them and they gave me an opportunity to 
use their dock and try out this project, which was huge. Wow. I'm extremely thankful they let me do yeah. this. And all I had to do was get the resources myself, which luckily weren't overly expensive. So I was okay spending the money <laughs> on that. And I had the opportunity to actually construct and put it out last July. And it's worked very, very well. It was almost kind of a tester because a lot of people I did talk to said in the grant funding grand scheme of things, people are like, we don't want to give money to people that have these really highly experimental projects. We mm -hmm. want to give money to things that we know will work. Mm -hmm. so that really drove me like, I need to put this out there if I really right. want to get this started. And I really, I want funding. I don't want to be using my personal bank account. <laughs> I'm very happy with how things are going. It definitely is going a lot better than I thought it would. I couldn't even dream to know like where I am with it now. I mean, it's amazing. So hopefully we'll get to do it in other places. Yeah. Uh, so I want to hear a little bit more about your results, but first I'm curious about the design. So I'm trying to picture what kind of structures you're building or how you're getting all of the oysters to yeah. grow the way they are. So a lot of the people that I talked to were really against using plastic. Obviously you don't want that. I mean, that causes another problem. So a lot of people were trying to find you know, biodegradable, plastic free. And that was like my number one priority was I don't want to use plastic. I want to use something that'll either biodegrade or is plastic free, won't release toxins and anything that will make it unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my first idea. And a lot of people have been using steel galvanized metal and cement are the two big ones that I've seen. And so I went towards the steel galvanized metal because that was cheaper. And I do not know how to make cement. So I wasn't even going to touch that. Probably a little and lighter to lift up and put in the water too, right? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and then a lot of people like to use just regular oyster shells because the oyster larvae is really attracted to their own kinds. And they like the little dip in the shell. So I knew I really wanted to incorporate that as well. And a lot of people have also just been using a lot of different designs. I've seen volcanoes. I've seen cages. I've seen cages made out of different things. You know, all these different ideas – but one that really stuck out to me was kind of a corral system where they would make rectangle squares in these just giant corrals. And so I was like, I really like that. And talking with a couple people that have done that really said it seems to work very, very well in terms of preventing predators from getting in and preventing the shells from washing away because the shells aren't very heavy. That's why a lot of people seem to be using cement because it sticks and sticks. So if you have storms, hurricanes, or just mm -hmm. bad weather with heavy tides, yeah. your shells can wash away unless there's enough right. of them or something else mm -hmm. holding them down. Yeah. I use those two. And then just to prevent, you know, there's a lot of snails and drills and a lot of animals that like to crawl under the dirt. So to, in order to prevent that, I found a really, really great product that's a biodegradable netting. And I put that as a base in my center so nothing can crawl underneath as well. So then you have a bottom net mm -hmm. and then a corral going around it. And is yeah. there anything over the top of it or is that just At open? the moment, no. I've definitely played around with the idea if maybe, you know, that could be incorporated for the next project or not, whether mm -hmm. that would be worth it, whether that would have any sort of positive effect, whether that would improve it, or if it really wouldn't change anything. Um, I've definitely played around with putting something on top, though. But I think it also would depend on the location of the next project. Right now, there's really not a lot of predators that I've seen, the main one being a crown conch snail. And I really haven't seen a lot. I Maybe 10 is the most Actually. I've seen in an a site visit wow. and that's really easy to just pluck out and chuck back to the ocean so a quick word about snails the crown conch melongina corona is found around oyster reefs and mudflats in florida and other oyster growing areas it feeds on oysters by inserting its proboscis between the valves of the shell when the oyster opens it to take in water and it eats it from the inside it's a villain on oyster reefs and can turn healthy reefs into barren outcrops of dead shell. But while they're nasty oyster killers, they do have exotic pointed spiral shells that every kid who goes to the beach wants to keep. So when you see them around oyster beds, take them. 
So after you put these oysters in the water in your corral or in the cages, mm -hmm. you, you're not done. You still have to go no. back in the water and tend to them? Yes, but thankfully the area that I'm in right now was very shallow. Um, I think the deepest I've had to go up was about my shoulders, mm -hmm. which was very cold because it was in like January. So uh, a little too cold for me. I don't like to get much deeper than about my hips. So it was it was a little difficult, but I do try to go just to show the progression. You know, I like to take a lot of photos. I think half my phone camera roll is filled with pictures of these oysters, and I pray to God, no one ever looks at the phone because they'd be very confused. <laughs> and I like to show the progression. I think a lot of people yeah. are really interested, like, oh, this is actually working. Like, you have photos from July when you put it down to now when you can actually see progress. You can actually see the growth. And I like to take photos of the individual shells as well to show, again, you know, here's the shell at the very beginning with absolutely nothing on it. And here's a shell now that is so just filled with these oyster larvae that are starting to grow their shell and calcify and cluster and stick together. So it's a really cool comparison. And I also just like going. It's very calming out there. Oh, and it's I'm sure. Really pretty out there and feel very happy and like tranquil. When you look at the growth and like mm -hmm. the new growth and larvae and the clustering that you said, do you ever just stand in the water and scream triumphantly. Usually, or I kind of like punch my fist in the air, put some stuff on like my Snapchat and like send to friends. I'm like, look at my kids, look at my babies. And they're like, you're so weird, but like actually good for you. You're the oyster mama. So now when I think about oyster aquaculture and mm -hmm. growing oysters for food, most of the farmers that I talk to usually say that the period of time it takes from spat to shuck mm -hmm. is usually around a year and a half to two yeah. years to get them to the right size. So how quickly are they growing in the wild the way you're doing it? It's about the same, I would Is say. It? It's very quick at first. I mean, I think within the first month of putting this in the water, we already saw spat on show. I was like, this is incredible. And mm. as the wow. time went on, you know, through the rest of 2023, it was just growth after growth after growth. I mean, it was always just this big change. Wow. And then since the start of 2024, there still is growth. I definitely will see, still see spat growing. I'll still see cl them clustering together, but it's not as quick. And based off of what I've read, it seems that the beginning stage is very, very quickly. And then from the juvenile stage to the adult, it's a little slower. It's Maybe it's that's nature's way of protecting them. Like get them to Maybe, grow big yeah. enough quickly so that they're a little safer from predators. I like that. Sort of thing. Let's go yeah. with that. I like that. <laughs> So are you relying on wild oyster larvae or are you seeding anything after you put shell down? I debated going the seed route, but I didn't really have the resources at the time to do mm -hmm. that. I have talked to a couple people that sell seeds, so that would be something maybe I would consider. But I just was looking for a location that I know that oysters have successfully grown and thrived and survived. And my theory was, as long as I'm in a location like that, this project will be successful. And talking to the man that owns the aquarium and talking to the man that owns the dock and has lived there for so many years, that was like my number one question was, have oysters grown? And he's like, yes, very well. You can see them and you can see them growing on tires off the dock. He's like, they do grow. Wow. I don't think you will have a problem attracting that. And it seems to have... He's, he was right. So yeah. when I look for another location, that's also something I do consider is have oysters grown here in the past, in recent in the past. I'm not talking, you know, 1950s. If, you know, if they've recently grown and thrived there, if I can see some a little ways away, that, kind, you know, in my opinion, I theorize that the project will successfully work in mm -hmm. growing those oysters if they, it is in a location that oysters have previously grown in. I guess there are very few oysters that are truly wild. Yeah. <laughs> to grow them the way you are and to mm -hmm. let the natural spawning in the water, you know, mm -hmm. create the new growth. That's awesome. <laughs> have you, <laughs> maybe this is getting a little too close to being oyster mama, but have you uh, ever eaten any of them? Mm -mm. No? no. You, come on, you no. haven't no. gone in there thinking... I wonder what these taste like. You pull out the They're little shucking knife. They're not big enough. Oh, okay, okay. 
So when they are big enough, are you going to be drooling as you look at your babies or are you <laughs> going to? It might be a struggle. We'll have to. <laughs> I mean, you could apologize to them. I can and, you apologize. Know, and let them understand that this is for the greater good. You're just checking, you know. I mean, I definitely <laughs> will be very intrigued. Like, are these actually going to taste good? Like... <laughs> Even though it's not for harvesting purposes. If you wanted to, to eat them, is the, the waters aren't condemned, the waters are suitable for eatable <laughs> oysters? I would believe so. I definitely Good. would ask beforehand just to sure. double check yeah. and ask somebody that's actually grown up in that area. Like, is this, mm -hmm. you know, this going to be cool or am I going to get like sick? So I would definitely ask. But if he was like, I don't really see a problem. You could take a slurp or two. I might take, I might take one. And one is one too many and two is never enough. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there are two schools of edible oyster cultures here. Mm -hmm. And that is the cultured oysters and the five different varieties that they grow in bags mm -hmm. and on the bottom and all that sort of thing. And then there's also the wild oysters, like mm -hmm. what you're growing. And I, I know here in Chincoteague, Virginia, we have both we have people growing mm -hmm. them in bags and nets and that sort of thing and then we have people actually finding beds mm -hmm. they early seeded years ago but they're actually pulling them in mm -hmm. those what is it called the bunch is like called a colch or something it's like Ulch, a, i think it's called yeah and mm -hmm. they're pulling them off and using mm -hmm. a little ball peen hammer and chipping mm -hmm. the oysters off so when you get them to eat them they're gnarly looking. They're like, not even, pretty. They're I know. It's kind of like munching on a dinosaur of some yeah. sort. So I suppose if you ever wanted to, that would be the kind of oysters that you would be producing. It would, but I haven't really thought too much about aquaculture. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would go that route. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, who the project is actually named after, was into aquaculture, and he did have a shellfish lease down near Melbourne. So he was oh, very okay. into that. He definitely did it more as a hobby instead of a full-time job. Right. But he loved it. And he also grew clams and scallops, but oysters were definitely the favorite. So you say you named the Zip Project mm -hmm. after your grandfather? Tell me about yeah. that. So we called him Zip. His name is John Stewart, but we all called him Zip, all the grandkids. And he... Zip had this lease it was a big hobby he's the the one that owns this beach house in new Smyrna. he was just very into the ocean very into restoration just very into conserving the environment and when i started really getting into this me and him always would have conversations about it you know he's like this is really cool i'm you know glad you got into this i really think you can do something with this so when i was starting to look into this project i always knew i wanted to name it the zip project because there's no nothing really like that, but it has that right. personal touch as well. So uh, the family really is, likes it too. <laughs> this sounds like a project of love. Yeah. And I'm sure Zip was very yeah. proud of you. So I, I sure hope so. You know what? I'm going to believe that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the local family is really cool. They think this is really amazing. They're very supportive. You know, my dad gives me a lot of advice and ideas as well. So they're very interested. They love it. They're very supportive about it. And you know, I think adding that name, you know, naming it after our grandfather adds that special little touch, like a family thing. Because I was wondering, like, zip, what does zip like? A, a lot of, a lot of people wonder. So, but with <laughs> Thank it's, you. It's yeah, fantastic. and I wanted a name that wasn't too generic or something that caught people's attention. And you know, wanted people wanted to know, and that would right. kind of spiral into, okay, this is a really cool name. So like, what exactly are you doing? You know, really get into that conversation. So right now you're operating just in one location. Is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. What's your plan for expanding if you have one? So, yeah, that's definitely my next goal is to really launch this project in another region in Florida, another ecosystem, just to show and see that this project can be successful. And again, the biggest requirement is as long as oysters are growing or have grown recently in that area. And I definitely want to focus on more in an area that really needs filter feeders. Up here in Panacea, they really don't need filter feeders. They don't have an algae bloom problem. They don't have a septic tank problem. They don't really have a pollution problem as big as a place like the Indian River Lagoon, or places like Lake Okeechobee, you know, all these different places that have these 
red tide problems, algae problems, brown water. You know, it's gross. It's disgusting. No one wants to go there. Right. So I definitely would love to see how much of a difference this project can make in an area like that, just to see, okay, this is making a really big difference. Or let's see if I put two of these projects next to each other, four, eight. So that's definitely, I'm definitely looking in more of those kind of locations that really need oysters. So when you're driving down the road along the waterways of Florida, mm-hmm. Are you kind of always looking out of the side of your eyes saying, hmm, that spot might be good? I do. I really do. <laughs> I'd probably be stopping and looking for oysters, and it's like, anything in there? I, I might have done that once or twice. Just so when like, people oh, see the girl walking along the water up to her knees or shoulders saying, what the hell is she doing out there? It's That's you. Okay, no, good I to definitely know. get a little curious. Like, do you have any? No. You don't have a reef? Do you do you want one? You know. Who wants a reef? Everybody wants a reef, right? I would Who wouldn't so. want this? It's really, really cool. cool. Proud. Is it dangerous? Like, you're going into the water, especially if you're going up, you know, deeper mm-hmm. into the water. There are larger predators, I think, in those areas. Are you ever concerned about sharks or anything oh, else really no i probably should be a little more concerned than i am i don't, don't know you have a lot of gators down there i don't know if it's because i'm used to it i don't know if it's like this really doesn't bother me i mean the beach i grew up going to new smyrna is the shark bite capital of the world so yeah, so, uh, so you've got this is like bring it on sure i might be a little used to it she's not kidding uh new smyrna beach florida is known as the shark bite capital of the world Volusia County, which includes New Smyrna, has the most shark attacks in Florida, with 343 incidents recorded. In 2023 alone, Volusia County had eight shark bites, representing 50% of the state's total in just one area. According to the International Shark Attack File, Florida currently has the highest rate of unprovoked shark attacks in the world. In 2023, it had 16 unprovoked bites, half of them in New Smyrna. That's 44% of the U.S. total and 23% of unprovoked bites worldwide. Some estimate that your chances of getting bitten by a shark in New Smyrna Beach are 10 times higher than anywhere else across the U.S. But hey, don't freak out about this. It's still dramatically less than your chance of getting struck by lightning. Also, most bites to humans here are usually the bite and release type deal. The shark realizes what it's mistakenly bitten into and moves on. Apparently, they don't like the way we taste. Still, it'll definitely ruin your day. If I hear a little splash, I'm like, what was that? But Uh, other than that, it really doesn't bother me. I almost enjoy it. I'm like, ooh, the water, yay. Which probably might concern some other people, but. (laughs) Well, a pair of legs deep in the water around a bunch of jagged oysters isn't that attractive to a hungry predator anyway, right? I I really hope not. So right now you're doing it all alone. Have you tried to drag any of um, your family members or sorority sisters or others into the water with you? Oh, no, I don't think any, at least my sorority sisters, uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh. They love it, and they, you know, they're super supportive. They all follow the Instagram account, but I don't think any of them. (laughs) They're not slipping into those sweaty waders and and heavy rubber boots anytime soon. No, eh? and the fam, kind of the same thing. My little brother's very interested. He's oh, majoring in environmental science up here at Florida State. So whenever he can, he'll come with me to the site visits. And wow. he's a big fisherman. So he's definitely very interested and intrigued by this. And whenever I go out without him or have meetings like this, he's like, how'd it go? How'd, how'd it go? What'd you learn? Um, oh, and my that's... dad's kind of the same thing. You know, probably after this, I'm going to call my parents and say, Guess what? This way. Well, they're very interested in it. My dad's very, very helpful. He grew up going on the water. He grew up mm. fishing, going to New Smyrna. So even going to this the shellfish lease. So he has some knowledge and he definitely knows some people. So he's very helpful when it's, you know, should I do this? I'm meeting with this person. What's something important I should say? Mm. Other than that, though, I rely a lot on just networking, you know, emailing, following people on social media, because that's what you got to do these days is oh, yeah. stalk people on Instagram. Yeah. And yeah. I will stalk you. I will find your information <laughs> and I will DM you or find that email and email you right away. I stalked you a little bit on Instagram. And oh, I do love you. all of the photos that you have of the <laughs> shells. And it's, it's really cool. It took a while to really figure out social media. I mean, I don't understand it a lot for a 23-year-old. Um, I have a lot of friends that are very into the whole influencer thing. So I really went to them like, how do I grow this? How do I 
make people want to follow and continue following me. You know, that was a really kind of struggle that I had for a while was really getting that message out there on social media and getting people interested in it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were like, you have to post a lot. And I'm like, well, this is oysters. It's really hard to post every day about this, you guys. This is not a sporting thing where something happens every five minutes. It's hard to really find things to post about every day. But, you know, I do try to post two, three times a week, following people, reposting things on the story, mm -hmm. DMing people, commenting, you know, that sort of thing. And a lot of people are like, it's the little things like that. You know, the more you comment, then it's like, okay, wait, this girl's commented three times. I got to go check out who this is. Yeah. You have a lot of followers. I mean, when you're talking about holding up pictures <laughs> of shells, that's pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. had a lot of educational stuff on your Instagram too, not just you and the shells, but also information about oysters in general yeah. and the environment in which mm -hmm. they grow. I have a friend who does, you know, her full-time job is running social media account. Mm -hmm. Shout out Olivia. She was like, do fun facts. Show people why you're doing this with oysters. People are like, this might be cool, but why did you choose oysters? Like, Mine and cheese, clams, scallops, you know, mm -hmm. why oysters? So Why did you choose oysters? You know, I think it was just the amount of research that I did on oysters and comparing them to other filter feeders mm -hmm. and just seeing that they have all these environmental benefits. You know, they can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. Like one single little shell can do that. I mean, that's incredible. That's and they can withstand yeah. drastic weather changes, which happens all the time in Florida. I'm pretty sure this state is bipolar. It's raining one day and then... <laughs> 20 minutes later, it's bright and sunny. And you never know here. And hot and, and humid, right? So humid. But right now it's cold. You never know at this state. It's terrible. Love it. It's terrible. But they can withstand all those drastic changes. And they can adjust quickly. They can filter out nitrogen and phosphorus that are in the waters. And that algae feed off of to grow these giant algae blooms, those big mm -hmm. green nasty things you see in the water. Yeah. So they have all these benefits, but people don't know that. So I thought, well, why not share that information? Why not show people why I did choose oysters? You know, a little education side of things. And then I did the same thing with marine mammals. You know, I've always had an interest in manatees, dolphins, whales, all these different marine mammals. So I wanted to incorporate that as well, but tie it back into oysters, not just give really cool facts like manatees are cool. Look at this cool fact about them, but manatees feed off of this. And then if they don't have seagrass, like oysters help with that. Dolphins rely on their habitat, stuff like that. It really I mean, is. oysters are keystone species. So without them, keystone. an ecosystem could yeah. essentially collapse. So I looked a little into keystone species and learned that a keystone species is an organism, whether a plant animal, bacteria, or fungi that has a disproportionately large impact on its environment. They play a critical role in the survival of other species, which in turn holds entire ecosystems together and supports biodiversity. Purple sea stars were the first recognized keystone species. Research by zoology professor Robert T. Payne showed that removing the sea stars from a tidal plain in Tatouche Island cut the tidal plain's biodiversity by half. Since then, scientists have identified many keystone species that are so important to an ecosystem, like oysters. They're sort of ecosystem engineers, significantly modifying and building new habitat for other species by forming reefs, which also cleans the water and holds the shoreline together. Think about honeybees. Their role as pollinators supports the reproduction of plants, which in turn provides vital food for a range of animal species. Without honeybees, we'd all eventually be dead. So I think that's really important to share to people is look at all these indirect things oysters have with all these different animals, all these different species, even with other people, you know, the coastline shoreline erosion problems that we have here in Florida. They get to break up wave energy. So all mm -hmm. these strong storms we have here in Florida, oysters can help slow it down and, you know, not prevent, but limit and decrease that wave energy, decrease the, the strength, which is, again, incredible because they're these, you know, little shells that people just think <laughs> of beating. In Florida, one of the most fiercely protected things along the edges of water are the mangroves. And that's yeah. because of mm -hmm. the root system, I think, really holds the shoreline together. Yeah, and they provide a lot of habitats. There are a lot of nurseries for a lot of different fish species and sharks. And they're they're also just really pretty. I mean, 
They're really yeah. beautiful. They make the shoreline look extremely pretty and aesthetic. And oysters can have reefs around that. So that's almost an extra barrier, an extra yeah. layer of protection. So just showing people and having people understand like, wait, oh my gosh, we need this. You know, getting people to want to have these projects, people wanting to contribute as much as they can to oyster restoration. I, I want to get that out. I want to show people. I want to That's teach amazing. people in a way. You're not trying to post a scientific treatise about oysters, but no. giving information yeah. does inspire people or, mm -hmm. or create an interest. I got to say, if I had waterfront property in Florida, I'd be planting oysters. I'd be throwing every oyster shell I ate out in the water when I'm done, hoping more grow on it. It's like protect your property. It's a great idea. And the benefits oh, to the environment are, mm -hmm. I say, they're remarkable. Yeah, they really are. Every week I'm looking up a fact and I'm like, wait, that's so cool. Or I'll see someone else post, you know, interesting facts or something they learned from their own projects. And I'm like, another thing oysters can do? Like, oh my gosh, yeah. who would have thought? You know, just stuff like that. Like, I never would have yeah. thought oysters could be an extra layer of protection when it comes to shoreline erosion. I never thought they could break up wave energy. I would have never known that. I would have never even thought of them being able to do that. Yeah. And it's like, well, now I know, and I'm going to let other people know. Are there many other people who you know in your area that are doing similar things, or are you the pioneer in New Smyrna? I definitely know a lot of, some, you know, other projects going on. There's one here at Florida State with the FSU Coastal and Marine Lab, and they're working on rebuilding oyster reefs in Apalachicola Bay, but that's more for an over-harvesting purpose, not for a filter feeder, improving right. the water quality aspect of it. But, you know, it's still really interesting to learn what they've known, what they've gained, what doesn't work, what has been working, their next goals, things like that. And there's a lot of, of these projects going on in the Indian River Lagoon, you know, New Smyrna, universities and Big organizations like Burvard Zoo, like Nature Conservancy, like FWC are doing oyster projects. It's a very up and coming habitat restoration industry, but it's so new. Everyone's doing different things. Everyone's mm -hmm. trying out different designs, different materials, different theories. It's so new. It's so loose. So it's kind of like try out what you think will work and go from there. If it doesn't, try again. There's not really a set in stone rules or strategies. It's loose. It's new. You know, everyone's trying these new things. Yeah. I think it is becoming a little bit more well known to people. Like, okay, oyster restoration. This is a serious thing. This can solve problems that we're having here in Florida. We, we need this. We need more to get this to us, especially in small communities. You know, these are happening in places like Tampa, in mm. Miami, these bigger cities, but those small little coastal towns not as much. So it really is a personalized grassroots sort of thing. Yeah. I don't know if you've followed much or had any involvement in the Billion Oyster mm -hmm. Project in yeah. New York and the mm -hmm. Chesapeake. Didn't Prince Harry visit when he was in the States I recently? I think he did. Yeah. Actually, it wasn't Prince Harry. It was Prince William who waded into New York's East River to check out the ongoing success of the Billion Oyster Project which is an initiative that seeks to restore oyster reefs to New York's waterways in order to rejuvenate the harbor's biodiversity, safeguard against strengthening severe weather, and connect the community with a more natural New York harbor. Later that day, he discussed it with United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez with an aim to shine a light on scalable solutions to global environmental challenges through such things as the Billion Oyster Project, and his own founded Earthshot Prize. And I think a lot of that's been so successful. That's really gotten people's attention. And I, it's Florida's turn. Bring it I here, too. It. Like, starting to get to that level of intensity and recognition, for sure. And one of the things that I've heard you allude to from your website, you want to do more than just develop these reefs. You're actually trying to market yourself and your services to others mm -hmm. who want to do similar things. Tell me a little bit about that. When I found out this could be something, I could grow into this. My initial thought was, all right, I'm doing this full time, like never working in an office again. This <laughs> one, here we go. Beats and, the hell out of an office, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> you know, like, how can I get this to be a full time gig? And 
we did recently register as an LLC, which is Great. exciting. And I dabbled with the idea of becoming a nonprofit. And I've talked to a lot of consultant and business people, you know, how have you made money? How have you made this into your full-time job and being able to make a living? Because, you know, you got to do that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> can't so, can't live just on oysters, especially if you're not no. eating them anyway. So, no, you know. unfortunately not. <clears throat> so I was like, how can I make this a business, a nonprofit organization? So taking me more seriously side of things so instead mm -hmm. of just, okay, look, 23-year-old grad students doing this, like, woohoo, instead of, oh, she's a nonprofit, you know, a little yeah. bit more legit. Mm -hmm. So I kind of looked into, can I have a service off of this? People want this built. I come and build it for you. And I do want to be involved. A lot of companies, a lot of organizations, a lot of people that I speak to in regards to wanting to do this project, like they have the land, they have the people. That's a big thing. I don't want them just to build it and here's money for letting us use your design. Like, thanks. I want to be involved in it. I want to meet these people that I'm talking to. I want to be able to construct this project. I want to be able to educate people. Like, this is why the project is built the way it is. And I want to come down on a monthly basis. Like, how's it going? Is there any problem? Are you finding anything weird? Are you finding anything interesting? I want to be involved, but I do also want to make this a full-time thing. That is a goal of mine after I graduate. I would like this to be a full-time thing, whether it's nonprofit, business, whatever it is most likely will be nonprofit. It sounds like it's part consulting and also actual physically developing and building the yeah. structures for yeah. others. And it's, it's not like it's hard. It's not like I don't think these people could build this. It's not rocket science. It's fairly simple, mm -hmm. but I want to be involved in it. And I do like meeting the people that I've talked to. Um, I had the opportunity to go and speak as a presenter at the Gulf of Mexico conference in Tampa last month. And I got to meet wow. a lot of people that I've emailed back and forth. I got to meet some FWC people. I got to meet some people that were like, oh, I've seen you on Instagram. This is really cool. I recognized your poster. So I like meeting people. I want to meet them in person. I want to talk to them in person and really gauge their interest in what we're doing. And also show that like, I, I do really care about this. And I do really care about the outcome and constructing it and all of the above. It sounds like you're right on the precipice of building kind of an expanding network of people doing it and mm -hmm. you're kind of yeah. helping coordinate all of it together. Mm -hmm. And everyone in this kind of community is really, really supportive. I mean, everyone emails back. Everyone's like, this is interesting. This is cool. You have something that could really change things. You have something that seems to be working like I'm excited for the future and it's either let's meet let's talk let me learn more about what you're doing let it let me tell you what we're doing let's see if we can figure something out or if it's we don't have the funding we have too many projects so sorry we can't help you they they will point you in other directions and give you recommendations like go read this paper go talk to this person so it's a great community. I mean, these people are really, really great. Yeah. <laughs> Oyster me... people are a passionate bunch, I find. Yeah, and even in just the marine science world, I've talked to yeah. aqu aquariums, the conservation people, FWC, you know, government people. And all of them are, they're passionate. They want you involved. They're, they're excited that I'm interested in having yeah. something and producing something. And they want to help as much as they can, whether I'm helping you or leading you to someone else that might either be a better fit, might have better information, might actually have land of some sort or resources of some sort. So it's great. It's wow. really great because I never knew. I never knew if I wouldn't be taken seriously. That was a big fear of mine was, sure. am I going to be taken seriously? Right. Oh, I hate saying this, but you know, I, I am young. Like I don't, I'm still in school, you know, are people going to take this seriously? Like I'm one person and I want to be taken seriously and show like, this is a serious thing. Like I have the passion. I have the drive. I have the creativity. I have these resources. I just need a little bit more. I need that push. I need that one, you know, take a little chance on me. <laughs> well, I think you're destined to do big things with this and Thank I can't you. wait to watch it happen. So what kind of oysters are these? Eastern oysters. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the only kind of oyster that would grow yeah, naturally. you know, in here in Florida, at least. You mentioned algae blooms, and we've heard about these massive oyster die-offs mm -hmm. from, what is it, MSX or other diseases or pollution. Have you had much opportunity to look at that? Not as much as I have with the algae blooms and with red tide and 
septic tank and fertilizer runoff, there are these diseases that have been killing off oysters, but I haven't really been looking much into that. I probably should. It sounds like you haven't needed to yet because your oysters seem to be thriving. No, I mean, not <laughs> You're focusing a lot on data collection, and you're mm -hmm. actually tracking this. Tell us about what kind of data do you collect, and what do you do with it? So, like I mentioned earlier, this is a new and growing thing. And a lot of people really haven't come up with a set of, this is what you look up when you do oyster mm -hmm. restoration. This is the data you collect. This is what you record. So, usually when I go, I take down what time I'm there and what time I leave. I take down the weather, the air temperature, the water temperature, the salinity and the pH. Is it acidic? Is it basic? Is the salinity lower maybe because it rained or is it a little higher? That sort of thing. Just to show these different small things like the salinity. Look at these different numbers. And oysters are still here and they're still growing. Look at the water temperature. I think in July it was in the 70s, 80s. And then in December, January, it's in the 50s. Look at this range that oysters are able to still live in. And I also take down the tides. When we're high tides, when we're low tides. I try to go during low tide because it's easier to walk and see, but sometimes my schedule doesn't allow me to. So <laughs> I try to do low tide. Sometimes that doesn't happen. And the rest and of the time also, is when you're up to your shoulders, I would imagine. Yes, yes. Yeah. I would like to not do that again, but because it's hard to show photos. Like, you can't see anything. Like, ah, it's too deep. Um, and then I try to do clarity, which is just taking photos, you know, hey, look at these photos. I'm standing on a dock and you can see perfectly down to the bottom. And then I do observations on the spat and larvae, you know, spat is still growing. They're starting to calcify. They're starting to form that shell. They're starting to cluster and stick together. You can start to see like a reef shape, you know, they're starting to take shape. And then I do just other observations, you know, it's what sometimes the tide is so low, the project is completely out of the water. There was a crown conch snail on the project. Little things like that. After mm -hmm. Hurricane Adalia, what, what was the condition of the project in after a hurricane? Thankfully, nothing. There was no damage. Nothing really? washed away. I was really nervous going to that. I was like, it's going to be gone. It's, it's <laughs> gone. It's destroyed. And it wasn't. So I was like, oh, yes. This is really cool. And proves the point of what you're doing, the yes, very essence of it. Yes, I will mention that any chance I can is it survived a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> and just stuff like that and take a lot of pictures. I mean, pictures of the project itself from different angles, taking video footage, taking pictures of individual shells. You can't count each individual little spat. So it's kind of like, look at these photos. There's 20 pictures of shells. All 20 have spat on it. And two of them have dead spat. That sort of thing. And I don't have a lot of tools. I know people that sit there and measure the length and width of the spat. There's a lot of different measurements and data that people collect. But I was just, again, one person doing this. I, I can only do what I'm able to do. And I am lucky that I am able to at least get pH, salinity, water temperature. The, yeah. A marine lab lets me use some of their equipment for that. They're really great. So I am grateful that I am at least able to show some data, some progress, some sort mm -hmm. of relation in terms of the environment conditions. So, You know, I'll bet there are a lot of undergrad and grad students in Florida and who would come to Florida who would love to work with you and just on a volunteer really so. or student basis. <laughs> It's fascinating. Yeah, I, you know, that's the goal. And right now, obviously, I just want to get another project in the water somewhere. So right. I'm right. really not picky. I want to work with universities, companies, independent people, zoos, aquariums. It doesn't really matter as long as they have some sort of passion for marine science or they do something involving mm -hmm. that or they want to get into habitat restoration. They want to get into things like this, like 100% right. open to it. Like, I will meet you anytime. Anywhere, you know, I will talk to you anytime, anywhere. I'm very open. So starting new projects or looking for the next one mm -hmm. or the one after that, do you have any concern about the, what do they call it, the NIMBY, not in my backyard kind of thing where people are going to either not give you permission mm -hmm. to do it where you want or complain if it's nearby? Not yet. <laughs> if they go <don't> into <laughs> the location first. But that's also why I tend to go towards bigger companies and organizations like Brevard Zoo, for example, they're a well-known place. They might have space. So I steer definitely more towards that rather than the independent person, just because 
they might have more resources and know how to handle situations like that. They're probably used to those situations and they probably know exactly the location I would want to do this thing. You know, they definitely better than I would. When I talked to the Marine lab, their one thing was like, you know, they do tours on the dock. They do a little living tour, Mm -hmm. living dock field trip. And they're just like, don't put it near there. Yeah. Other than that, like, you're fine. Don't put it near the boats and don't put it near where we give tours. And I was like, okay. That's here we great. Go. So now, as amazing as all of this sounds, there's got to be a part of this job that sucks because a part of every job sucks. Yeah. What's the worst part of this to you? The money. <laughs> I have to use, like, my own personal bank account at the moment. And luckily, it's not overly expensive, and it's not like I'm dropping thousands of dollars. But it would be really nice if I didn't have to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and maybe, you know, I could spend a little more money on things like social media and marketing and mm-hmm. getting the word out better and maybe actually purchasing measurement tools of my own to collect data instead of borrowing constantly when I go. Again, right. I can definitely purchase that on my own. I just would really prefer not to. <laughs> well, I mean, you're a 23 year old student, so it's not like you've got all of this disposable income to throw around. No. <laughs> I need to find that draw, finding that attention grabber, finding that draw to switching it from this sounds interesting to, okay, we need this. We are doing this. We are going to find a way to do this has been yeah. a little challenging. <laughs> well, going on this, the, the speaker circuit, like it sounds like you've already started that, uh, I'm sure is an excellent I hope way so. to do it. <laughs> Okay, so I've asked you what's the worst part. What's the your, what's the one thing that just makes all of the rest worthwhile? That I'm making a difference. I think yeah. that I'm actually doing this, and it's, I hope, it's going to make a big difference. You know, it's mm-hmm. going to change the environment, environmental science, the marine world, and even indirectly affecting the community, coastal towns, you know, people that maybe relied on commercial fishing and harvesting and things like that, that oysters help. They make it look pretty. You know, people don't want to go paddle boarding on brown water. They want to go paddle boarding on clear water so they can see everything underneath instead of saying, why is it brown? This is disgusting. I'm never coming here again. Right. Um, So even just little things like that. I'm excited that this has been working and I'm excited to where it's going to go. And I never know what the future is going to hold. I never know what I'm doing a week from today. I never thought I'd be on a podcast talking about this. So you never know what you're doing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself in five years? Ooh, five years. Um, In five years, I do hope this is a full-time business, whether Mm -hmm. that's a nonprofit, a business, whatever that is. And that I'm making a real difference, that I am being recognized. You know, instead of me going out and reaching out to people, people are reaching out to me. Like, Hi, I I want the zip project. I need to do the zip project. I, right. you know, need this on this land. I need this in Jacksonville. I need this in Fort Lauderdale. I need this in Sarasota. I need this in Alabama. I need this in Georgia. You know, in five years, I do hope to have expanded beyond Florida, whether it's the Gulf states, whether it's East Coast states. And also, again, have that draw, have people reaching out to me instead of me emailing 10 people a day saying, hi, my name's Betsy. This is what I'm doing. I'd love to talk. <laughs> it, it always starts with groveling a little bit, but that's it's, good because you don't seem shy about doing that, which no, is great. I really have no shame. You know, I meet somebody and they're like, email me. And I'm like, oh, I will. Yeah. Email from me today or tomorrow. This isn't just polite talk. I will follow like, up I will, with you. I will. Yes, I will be emailing you and I'll probably go follow you on Instagram. I think that your whole data collection thing is really helpful for yeah. your expansion plan because... <laughs> If people want to do something with you, Mm -hmm. one of the first questions they're going to have is, what's the difference in the water and the temperatures and Mm -hmm. what experiences could we expect to have in different environmental conditions? Mm -hmm. The party was like, I have to write something down. (laughs) In a year or two, I'm going to pester you for a follow-up so we can see how the babies are doing now. I'll already say yes. I have absolutely no doubt that you are going to be incredibly successful and you're not only going to grow what you're doing, you're going to inspire others. Mm -hmm. And anybody out there that's looking for an opportunity 
to make a difference, you're the one they need to call because it's a win-win and Mother Nature is happy about it too. Thank you so much. Well, Betsy Stewart, this has been (laughs) so interesting and fun and thank you so much for taking the time and being my guest. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking me. (laughs) Since I sat down with Betsy, she's been very busy growing oyster reefs around Florida including adding new reef projects in Panacea, Melbourne, Panama City, and New Smyrna Beach. And she's been giving presentations of her work to people, including presenting at the recent International Conference on Shellfish Restoration. And she just launched a new and improved website, thezipproject.com, which you should definitely check out to get a good look at the impressive work she's doing. Well, that's it for this episode of Oysterology. Thanks to my guest, Betsy Stewart. As always, show notes can be found on this episode's page. And if you enjoyed it, please rate or review it on whatever podcast platform you listen in on. I'm your host, Kevin Cox. Join me next week when we pry open the shell of another interesting oysterology topic.